subject I'm going to address this morning is one that each time that I address it, I recognize more and more, say yearly, if not sooner, the probability of it being classified as hate speech because that's the atmosphere that we live in, and it grows bad and worse from day to day. All of us remember the denominational preacher, Billy Graham, the late Billy Graham. He at one time took a strong stand against uh, more, uh, homosexuality and for biblical morals. But at the end of his life, he waffled on that, and he never was right when it came to what the church was, plan of salvation, and so forth. But his son, Franklin Graham, has taken a strong stand against homosexuality. Now, where does that go? Well, it goes to here. He was set to do one of their famous uh, crusades not long ago in Liverpool, England, and they were getting a, some sort of big auditorium that was owned by the city, and they stopped him. They said that they did not want his hate speech there because he was addressing morals and in addressing morality as the Bible teaches it, he would then oppose homosexuality. And they shut it down and said, we have a diverse city, we're happy, we're peaceful, we will not tolerate it being upset by such hate speech. Now, you can think of the implications of that if you will and what it means about what the Bible says and the, the culture that's known as the cancel culture and how if you don't like it, you know, you get rid of everything you don't like and who, who it is that doesn't like it are those that don't like God, Christ, or the Bible. And uh, you say, oh, that's there. Well, no, it's here. And uh, what I'm about to say, if we were saying this in an auditorium here around Harris County or anywhere in the United States, then it more than likely would cause more of an uproar publicly than we could begin to even realize. And there may be a day coming when it will do so just speaking from the pulpits owned by the churches. Now, that's just reality. Face it. Don't turn a deaf ear to it and say that's a lot of uh, fantasy. It's not, especially for our young people and your younger parents raising your children. You must still teach them about God and Christ and the Bible and the truth about salvation and the church and godly living. And that is just a must. So what does the Bible teach about homosexuality? I have a lot to say and little time to do it. I'm entering this discussion this morning on the assumption that one accepts the Bible as the inspired, all-sufficient, final and complete revelation of God to man, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, as the final authority of all things pertaining to life and godliness. Now, we could deal with those other things, but there are those who are saying, yes, God is, the Bible is the Word of God, Christ is the Savior, but there's nothing wrong with homosexuality. I'm addressing those people. You say, well, how can they do that? Well, how can they say I love God and abort babies. How can they say any of those things? It simply comes down to how deceived we can become to doing what we talked about a couple of weeks ago, gratifying the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So what does the Bible have to say about it? First of all, in the days of the patriarchs, that first great period in which God dealt with man, first great religion on earth, the patriarchal age, from Genesis 1, 1 to Exodus 20, covering about 2,500 years. No written law. God dealt with man through the patriarch, the father. It's called the father rule, period 2, the head of the family. In Genesis 19, verses 24 through 28, Moses describes the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Of course, he was inspired of the Holy Spirit to write down what he did. It's infallible. The Apostle Peter takes that, inspired by the same Holy Spirit, explains that this unique judgment upon these two cities was to serve as an example. Yes, it's a negative example. Don't be as they were. Here's what he said in 2 Peter 2.6. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them to destruction. And I'll be quoting from the New King James most everything, unless I happen to fall back on the King James. Making them an example to those who afterward would live 
ungodly. Again, 2 Peter 2, 6. Well, why was Sodom and Gomorrah chosen to be an example of God's ultimate and really final judgment upon the ungodly? What were they doing that made them so different from other ungodly cities in that time? Well, they were not the only ungodly cities. Here is exactly what Abraham was told. Genesis 18, verse 20, in answer to that question. And the Lord said, just put a peg down right there. Who said it? The Lord said. And the Lord said, because the outcry of against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous. Well, that raises the question. Remembering that sin is the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4, which means there was patriarchal law that God expected all men to keep at that time. It just wasn't written down. It wasn't codified. And remembering in one translation of 1 John 3, 4, means sin is lawlessness. That's what he means. So what was their sin? What was their lawlessness? What was their transgression of the law? Because it was very grievous as far as God's concerned. And that concerns me when I see God saying something is very grievous. Well, some who claim to believe the Bible, but at the same time seek to uphold homosexuality, attempt to explain that the sin of the inhabitants of the city was simply a lack of hospitality on their part. I, almost, I have a hard time saying that straight face, but that's what they say. Highly learned people who say God exists, Jesus is Savior, the Bible is the Word of God. Well, is that truly the case? Well, now, let's look at the text. Just read the words of God to get the thoughts of God. Verse 4, Genesis 19, concerning the two men who we know are angels who came in, they took the um, form of men. They were in Lot's house. The men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all, not some or most or few, all of the people from every quarter surrounded the house. This is 19.4. Now, you don't think a whole bunch of people can't get so depraved that they all, as one, want to do the same thing? Now note, first of all, all the people. I emphasize it again. All the people in the city are desiring to participate in whatever, we'll say at this point, this sin is. Well, listen to verse 5 of Genesis 19. And they called to Lot and said to him, they surrounded the house, old, young, from every quarter of the city, everybody, men. Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. Now, the word carnally is not in the actual Hebrew text. It was supplied or adopted by the translators because of the word that we find in the Old King James Version, which is really more in uh, exact translation of the Hebrew, that we may know them. Because that's often used and was among the Hebrews as a nice euphemism for sexual relations. And you can see that in Adam knowing his wife Eve, Genesis 4.1, and also in verse 17. But here it's said, uh, so, you know, some people today in their studies, they just can't look up a word and find out what it means as far as how it was used in the Bible. So you have to tell them. It's talking about knowing them carnally. I, I don't know that. That helps because people won't read and understand words. They have to go look that up too. Lot's response, though, to this mob certainly indicates that's how he understood, how he, Lot, understood the multitude's request. Now look at verses 6 and 7. So Lot went out to them through the doorway, shut the door behind them, and said, Please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. Well, clearly Lot understood the intentions, and those intentions were wicked. The next statement by Lot is hard to understand. Difficult to grasp this, just for me. 
But maybe it expresses his concept of hospitality in that he was willing to suffer deep, intimate, personal loss rather than to allow this wicked thing to happen to his guests. Verse 8 reads, See now, Lot says, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Please let me bring them out to you, and you may do to them as you wish. Only do nothing to these men, since this is the reason they've come under the shadow of my roof. Now, Lot's amazing offer, startling offer of his two daughters at least confirms, and sometimes we get so startled over the offer, we don't see what's really confirmed here. That he understood the crowd's intentions, that they were sexual in nature. But now notice also, Lot explains that his original, his original hospitality to these two men, these two strangers, Genesis 19, 1 through 3 is where you find it, was precisely to protect the homosexual rape the crowd intended. Now, it's also interesting that a crowd of this kind of debauched persons, in view of the fact that Lot's two virgin daughters live there among them all the time, and their homosexual men wouldn't be that interested in two virgin daughters. Does that even further tell you how down the drain they've gone morally? We don't know that, but it's as much of a possibility as anything else. The crowd, though, had a response. And I think that's insightful, too. They said, stand back, get out of the way, Lot. Here's what they said. This one, you, Lot, came in to sojourn, that is to live among them, and he keeps acting as a judge. Does that sound familiar? Don't judge me. Who are you to judge me? He keeps acting as a judge. Now watch. They knew what they were doing wasn't acceptable to some people somewhere because they said, now we will deal worse with you than with them. Bad we're going to do to them. We're going to do worse to you. <laughs> so they pressed hard against Lot and came near to break down the door. Of course, the story is, is the angels pulled them in and so forth. Their, their reaction, and that's the point. The mob, this lusting mob, is similar to homosexuals and other immoral people today, as well as a lot of people caught up in even religious sins. Don't point out from the Bible that I'm living contrary to the Bible. Don't tell me what God said. I am enjoying what I am doing, and I think God accepts me. To those who would dare to point out such sinful conduct, then um, they will say, who are you to judge? Folks, fo people who sin enjoy sinning. You realize that? It's said of Moses that he chose to suffer for people of God rather to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Do not tell me sin is not pleasurable. If it wasn't pleasurable, why would you engage in it? You don't go around beating your thumb up with a hammer and say, isn't that fun? No, you do things because it appeals to you. Remember the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride or vainglory of life? What such people fail to understand is this, and we have them in the church. When one points out what the Word of God says about one's beliefs and conduct, the person exposing their sin is not personally of himself or herself alone <laughs> judging them. It is the word of the living God. That's God's manifestation of his thoughts on the matter doing the judging. What happens is this. They can't get to the person who originated the message, God, so they take on the messenger condemning and persecuting him. New Testament, Stephen, first Christian martyr exactly what happened and it happens today and if you're going to be a faithful member of the church and all that the Bible defines that to mean you've got to expect that and while we used to basically have to just debate things that had to do with religious wrongs oh no the people we're going to have to deal with and are having to deal with now you have a home Bible study or whatever you're going to have to, be able to teach the truth on these things 
And right here in patriarchy, Genesis, the origin of things, you can find out how to start doing it. Because mark this down. Listen to me. God's moral law, whether it's patriarchy, the law of Moses for the Jews, or Christianity, has never changed. It's always been a sin to murder, to lie, to steal, and to do such things as we're talking about here. It's always been that way. Now, the homosexual was a grievous sin. Now, sin's bad enough, but it's telling us something when you have that descriptive term uh, grievous added to it, Genesis 18, 20. And it becomes even more apparent when we consider what's written in the New Testament when it reaches back under Romans 15, verse 4, and says, people in the church, here's a lesson for you from those people back there. Jude wrote, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Jude verse 7. Do you think this kind of preaching was done quite often among the Roman Empire where such things were routine and regular? Well, certainly it was. And once you converted people out of that, don't you think you had to write to them over and over again since most of the New Testament, remember, is written to Christians to keep them faithful, to keep them out of such messes as that? Notice that Jude described the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah as sexual immorality and going after strange flesh. Strange there means not authorized, not taught by God, not acceptable to God, contrary to his will. This is nothing about, uh, there's nothing about the sin or of lack of hospitality. Uh, only those desperate, extreme desperation try to justify their homosexual conduct or their friends or families that uh, engage in such an excuse or saying it was acceptable to God and using that for a reason. It's just not there in the text. And if you accept the text as God's word, in patriarchy, there you have it. And it doesn't change through all of patriarchy. Now, moving to the Mosaical Age, that 1,500-year period, with the giving of the law in Exodus 20, down to nail to the cross, Colossians 2.14, church of our Lord starting Acts 2. Homosexuality under the law of Moses was a capital crime. A capital crime. You know, I'm very grateful we're not under the law of Moses for various reasons. It was nailed to the cross, and thus we're not under it, Colossians 2.14. Because the vi violations of certain laws under the law of Moses were very, very harsh. They were terrible in this life. And they were visited if people were faithful to the law immediately on people. Well, that's changed. Has it? Well, look, we must remember that the New Testament is the last will and testament of he who is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father but by him, the New Testament of the Bible. And under that testament, there are much harsher punishments for similar crimes unrepented of. It's just delayed, folks. Delayed to the final, complete day of judgment at the end of the world. Now, that's the reasoning of the inspired writer to the Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 through 31. And he wrote that to Jews who become Christians and were being persecuted and thinking about leaving the New Testament and say, you leave this, you, you trample underfoot the grace of God presented in the gospel, it's going to be far worse on you than anything you ever read of in the Old Testament that happened to those people when they violated the law. Romans seven twelve, Paul wrote, Therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Even will say his salvation could have come by the law, or have come by the law of Moses. He also wrote later that it was, as I alluded to earlier, Romans 15, 4, written for our learning. In other words, I can learn from the Old Testament how to better obey Christ in the New Testament. That God says what he means and he means what he says. So we can learn from the law about God's view of homosexual conduct. Now look at Leviticus. 
uh, I've, I've always taught, been taught, the Leviticus, the Levitical priesthood. This is a way to remember what goes on there is it's Israel's approach to God. Israel had to go through the priest of the Levitical whatever is that's involved there, quite intricate. Leviticus 18.22. I want you to notice how difficult this is to understand. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. You know, you want to say, what is there you don't understand about that? We left patriarchy. We're now with the Jews under the law of Moses. Can, can it be clearer? Homosexuality is an abomination to the Lord, along with bestiality, and they all tend to come at about the same time. Leviticus 18, verse 23. People can be so debased as to engage in about any heinous mess that godly people and people living like the Bible and training their mind to live like the Bible and morals and religion have a hard time grasping. One of the things about the land of Canaan, the people that were driven out by the Israelites was that they were given over to this and had for many years and worn out their time. The iniquity of those people was full, and God said, now it's time for punishment, not time for repentance. And he used the Israelites to do it, Leviticus 18, 24 through 25. In fact, he says uh, to the Israelites that if, um, if you do the things they do, then the land will spew you out. Literally, the Hebrews vomit you out. I think it's that way in the New King James, Leviticus 18, verses 26 through 30. Further, the book of Leviticus tells us, I want you to notice how difficult this is to grasp. If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 13. Again, I emphasize, we are under the authority of Christ in his New Testament. We are not under the law of Moses. What we do learn from this passage is this. While the law of Moses was in effect for the Jews, homosexuality was a grave offense worthy of death. So we leave patriarchy, we leave the law of Moses, and now we come to the New Testament. We've already read enough to know really where that is, but the New Testament's quite clear in that it condemns homosexual conduct. To God's church at Corinth, the inspired apostle Paul wrote, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous. By the way, covetous people, he puts you right there with the homosexuals. Nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. In this passage, Paul uses two terms. The Holy Spirit guided him to say these things, to use these terms. These two terms are translated homosexuals and sodomites. Again, I'm referring to New King James and there are other versions, but that in particular. The first term translated homosexuals, effeminate in the King James Version, is malakos. Malakos. Now, it's defined by the Greek lexicographer Thayer as effeminate of a catamite, a male who submits his body to unnatural lewdness. In the New King James, the word translated sodomites in the King James, abusers of themselves with mankind, is arsenokoitai, arsenokoitai. 
koitai. Thayer defines it as one who lies with the male as with a female, a sodomite. I, I think we need to recognize that in speaking as the oracles of God, which we're charged to do, then call them what the Holy Spirit called them, that is, sodomites. Paul's warning not to be deceived is very up to date because that's why we're teaching what we're teaching now. It needs to be taught in the homes, in the Bible classes, from the pulpits. This is the case because some, shall we call them theologians, would have us believe that the Apostle Paul was only condemning male prostitution. And although the uh, first word, malakos, properly speaks of a male prostitute, that's not the only word the Holy Spirit used, is it? The Holy Spirit also used arsenokoitai. And that describes any sort of homosexual conduct. And despite such efforts to twist, rest, destroy the scriptures, and thereby deceive many, the word of God is clear. When rightly divided, and honest-hearted people, Luke 8, 15, study it with the intent to obey it. Those who continue to engage in homosexuality will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, there's only one other place you go when you do not inherit the kingdom of God at the end of time. Let me pause here and emphasize this part. I would preach against being a thief. I would preach against being a murderer. I would preach against being a liar. I would uphold honesty and telling the truth on anything. I would oppose those in religious sins who teach that baptism is not for the remission of sins. That is the baptism of, say, Acts 2.38. I would try to point out that belief alone won't save you. I do all of that not because I hate those people. If I hated them, I'd leave them alone and let them go to hell and not even try to save them. But every faithful member of the church... Every faithful gospel preacher, every elder, deacon, and Bible school teacher, every parent that loves the truth supremely, that loves God with all that he has and is and loves his neighbors himself, is under the great commission to preach the gospel to every creature. And that means exposing the sins of people, whether they're religious sins or moral sins. Now, why do you do that? So people will know to come out of those sins. Why did Stephen, the first Christian martyr, die? Because he hated his audience? He didn't have to die. He didn't have to say those things that he did say. But they were needed to be said, and the Holy Spirit guided him to say those things and had Luke accurately record what he said. Sometimes the things we need to hear are not pleasant at all. You go to the doctor and have a bunch of tests because you're not feeling good, and he turns around and tells you, you have big C, you have cancer. And you say, well, I, I, I can't I believe that. We go to three other doctors and tell you the same thing. Well, if you can go on the basis of modern-day medical science, what are you going to do? Close your eyes to it because you don't feel bad right now. They cannot see it far off. It's a pretty good description of a lot of things, not only in religious matters and moral matters, but also in other matters. Now, the next verse, chapter 6, verse 11, gives then great hope expectation of salvation for anyone trapped in the sin of homosexuality or whatever sin it may be. Because he says, and such were, that's past tense, used to be, not anymore. And such were some of you. That's what you call conversion. Some of these people heard the truth and in the heart they believed it. They were living this kind of life. But in repentance, having believed in Christ, they gave it up. Paul also used the word arsenia koitai, which again is a generic term for homosexual conduct, as an example of uh, that which is contrary to sound doctrine. Sound doctrine means wholesome teaching. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, 1 Timothy 1, 10 through 11. Now, since it is the case that the sound doctrine, wholesome teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is God's power to save us from sin, Romans 1.16, 
condemns sexual relations between unmarried, hetero, heterosexuals. It shouldn't be difficult to understand that sex between homosexuals is wrong too. As for, quote, married, unquote, homosexuals, the institution of marriage which was begun and defined by God only authorizes sexual relations between a man and a woman who are husband and wife. Plainly taught in the beginning in Genesis 2, verse 24, and restated by Christ in Matthew 19, verses 4 through 6. It must be a God-joined, undefiled bed marriage. Oh, you say, well, I know people that are married this way. Well, the world may call it marriage. Courts may call it marriage. Legislation may call it marriage. But does God call it marriage from the standpoint of a Matthew 19, 6, God-joined marriage? That's what I'm interested in. The world calls all sorts of things baptism. That doesn't mean God does. That's the reason we spend so much time on baptism being a burial in water. That it's for the believer. That it's after one's repented. That it's for the remission of sins. That's how one gets into Christ in no other way. The scripture in the New Testament stands out in its condemnation of the sins of homosexual conduct. I think you know that Romans 1 verses 18 through 28 stands out as a classic passage that deals with a lot of this. Paul discusses the wrath of God which is directed toward those who do not honor God. Listen, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, vain, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Romans 1, 18 through 23. Now, listen. The righteous indignation of a just God is directed against those who reject the clear evidence of God's existence and power as revealed in nature. And if religious at all, they make God over in their own image, an image of their own choosing. Now, today we are not plagued, at least in this country, by the same kind of idolatry that characterized the first century world. But we continue to attempt to make God over into our own image so that he thinks like us, acts like us, and we think about him like we would any other human being. We need to read Isaiah 55, 8, 9 and know that God's not a man. I don't know why that's such a difficult thing, but it seems that we forget that. How, God exp uh, how does God express his uh, righteous indignation? Well, this gets interesting. How does he do so short of a final complete judgment day? Paul tells us something that sometimes I don't think we see. In this time of probation where he's giving men time to change and allowing many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years to pass by. For God's not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but his long suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Romans 1, 24, 25 tells us how he does that. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Verses 24 and 25 I say. Rather than, in other words, bringing the judgment day or striking them down the bolt of lightning out of the sky, God has expressed his righteous indignation by giving them up. 
to moral uncleanness because they wouldn't be turned. They wouldn't do it. That's what they love. Well, how do you know? Because I know a little bit about history and I can see what's happening today without reading the Bible. If God were to strike down everybody today that ought to be struck down, there'd be so few people walking this earth. Now, why does he let it go on? Why does he let people continue to deny his existence, reject the truth of God's word? Because it's just the way it is right now. But that doesn't mean there's not a final judgment coming where he will destroy all. And what's he going to do? He's already telling you. All these little judgments on earth, here's what it's going to be for everybody at the end of time. So those who are not willing to honor God as God are, as God are simply allowed to degenerate into moral decay. How do I know that? I can read my Bible. That's what it says. That's what people have done. Here's how Paul said it. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Romans 1.26. Now this is a strong allusion to lesbianism where women cease to appreciate that their bodies are naturally designed physically for sex with men and for procreation. And who think of our bodies, our cells, solely as instruments of vile passions for one another. They know their unborn baby is not their body, but they will argue that it's their body, so they will kill their baby. Now, we talk about homosexuality. You realize the depraved mind that will allow a person to do that can go just as deep as a homosexuality. One accompanies the other. Regarding those men... God's given up to uncleanness. Paul writes, Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one for another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due, Romans 1.27. In similar fashion, many of those men who have been given up by God, that is the uncleanness they entered into, the way the Bible describes it. Leave the natural use of the woman. Romans 1.28 makes that clear. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Three times in this section, we find the expression, God gave them up or gave them over. Romans 1.24, 26, 28. There's a clear point here. When people choose to reject God or to recreate Him in their own image and they persist in it, what's God going to do? He's going to give them up. He's going to give them up. He's going to let them go their own way. Unrestrained by God in any way, then they gravitate into increasing levels of immorality. For some, it involves heterosexual immorality, adultery as we normally think of it, fornication as we normally think of it, premarital sex and except all that kind of stuff. For others, it includes homosexuality, lesbianism, and bestiality, and uh, everything else that's horrible. You say, ah, that can't happen. It, it did happen. The Bible tells you so. And people are that way when they desire not to retain God in their knowledge. Let me ask you this. As we bring the lesson close to a close. What's happening in this nation today? People are running to find God, or are they running away from God? In moral matters, I mean. Not just religion matters, but moral matters. Are they designed to retain God in their knowledge? Are they designed to live according to the morality taught in God's good work? There was a time when denominations stood pretty much shoulder to shoulder on all matters moral. What was right and wrong, they don't anymore. Notice Romans one twenty seven. In doing what they did by their behavior, they received in themselves a penalty of their error which was due. I can't say that AIDS came along just specifically because of this. I can't say that any other sexual transmitted diseases, STDs, come along strictly and only because of this. But here's what I definitely can say. Those who are willing and love to follow God's word as to sexual conduct have far, far less to fear about STDs than those who choose to disregard them. And if you want to do some statistical study, I think you'll find be very surprised as to where these STDs show up, where most of them are. Conclusion? It was a grievous sin in the times of the patriarchs, that is, homosexuality. 
the time of the law of Moses for the Jews, it was an abomination. And today under Jesus Christ who loves us and wants us to be saved, it's shameful, indicative of a debased mind, and contrary to sound doctrine according to the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Biblical evidence is there that people can change. I brought that out, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. I'm glad to tell you you can. I don't care what they claim science says. There is no genetic proof that says you're born to where you can't help from being a homosexual. Now, people can have dispositions toward that. But they're obligated to resist it according to the teaching of the Bible. There's some people like a swig of whiskey more than somebody else. But when they want to serve God, they know that. One time, General Lee was offered a snort out of the jug. He found out what it was, and he made it very clear he wouldn't because he liked it too much. When you know something appeals to you and is contrary to the Word of God as a person of a free moral agent, you have the obligation to say, I can't touch it. I can't be around it. And the Lord told us that a long time ago, evil companionship corrupts good morals. That's simple. He says, and such were some of you, and I close on that lesson. We've all been in sin of some sort or the other. I've never been a murderer, but the greatest servant of Christ I ever know of among men, as far as the church is concerned, is the Apostle Paul. He was a murderer. He said he was the chief of sinners. He said, I obtained mercy. That's what we want for everybody. So in our opposition to homosexuals and lesbians and all that and the corrupt life they live, it's not because we want to put them down and treat them bad. We want them to be converted. And that's why we deliver the truth of God on these matters. Because if they're not, here's where it's headed. And the Bible's clear on the matter, if you will accept what the Bible says. If you need to obey the gospel, we've studied what to do to do that. You need to repent of sins, whatever they may be. Confess them and pray God for forgiveness. Then this song we're about to see encourages you to obey the gospel while we stand and while we sing.